Hello everyone and it's fabulous to see so many people. Isn't it lovely when you can flick through a screen like this and start seeing people popping up? So thank you for joining us today. Um, we're running this um, session um, uh, uh, because there's been an awful lot of response and request to run this kind of session. So it's always good when you think that I think we're pr pretty much going to hit things that people are interested in. So um, my name is Maureen Mallon. I'm the Chief Executive here at Oscar. I've um, been here for about two and a half years now. Um, sometimes it feels much longer through all these complicated times and sometimes it feels like two minutes but fabulous place to be. Um, I'm joined by a number of colleagues um, and let's not take it personally that I'm not going to introduce all of them because it would take ages but um, let's just uh, know, know that I'm going to introduce the people who are going to be talking to you mostly. So you've all met Paula earlier on there just very briefly who's who's been getting back and forth to you all and has organised and coordinated this event. Um, next up I'm going to introduce Martin Tyson who's going to be leading you through the presentation. Martin just did a quick wave there um, and also I'm going to introduce you to Jude Turbine. Um, so hello Jude. And Jude is our um, Senior Manager for Policy and Sector Improvement and she will be organising and coordinating the Q&A. It's always her favourite bit I think actually to do that ma master MC of all that kind of ceremony bit. So she's terribly, terribly good at all of that. And what she's going to manage to do is not only squeeze in all of the questions that we've got in advance from you all and thank you so much for that, but hopefully we'll be able to be a little bit interactive along the way too. So let's just talk about that. If you have questions questions coming up and you don't think you're going to remember them for later on in the Q&A, then pop them into the chat at the side and we'll try and pick up on them there. Um, but hopefully we will have a bit of time for some of those, those extra questions that you haven't managed to send in anything that's coming up through the presentation from Martin. So the other colleagues that we have here um, who might just all wave at you are from a combination of, uh, of, of our, uh, our comms team and our policy team. So hello all. There we are, a few little waves there, see? Fantastic. So let's do a few little bits of housekeeping um, before we get a start. Um, we are recording today and that's because we want to make sure that we can take all of the messaging from this and all the lessons from it and put it onto YouTube to share. And what we found um, through, through a number of these um, events recently is that as we do that, they're getting a very large amount of hits. So people who couldn't manage along today are then coming on or people who were there in the, and thought, I wonder what happened a few months ago are coming on so massive amount of hits coming through on that if you don't want to be recorded then just pop your uh, pop, pop your camera off so that you're not being picked up on that so it's just to let you know that um it would be great if everybody could keep themselves muted unless you're asking a question that way we'll um we'll we'll, we'll we won't have oh thank you john i've I, having just checked out too to see whether or not we could hear you and then i'm asking you to do that how rude um but the idea is very much that we want to make sure that you can really hear what's going on and it'll stop all the interference um but please do make sure that you can come on live if you're going to ask a question so why are we having this event? Um, as I said, we've had lots of queries around it. And we know that um, thinking about your governing document is something that some people do quite regularly, but probably most organisations don't do enough. Stopping and thinking about your governing document and actually what your core purposes are is such a useful thing to do to stop and take stock of where you're landing. Sometimes things get things move so organically, you find yourself doing things that um, perhaps are out with your purposes for all sorts of reasons. And Martin will go into that uh, uh, later on, no doubt. So doing that, thinking about it, updating is required. It shouldn't be a scary thing that things just catch you on the hop years, years and years later. So what we we want to do is try and think about how, how, how you should do that and being a lot more proactive. Oscar very much want to be an enabling regulator and I use that word quite often as I'm talking about Oscar so what do we mean by that? What we mean is that we want to make sure that we are sharing lessons we don't want to be one of those those regulators that sit in the background waiting for someone to make a mistake, anything, but we want to make sure that we're getting the messages out. That's why we, we ask people a lot of questions and queries through our surveys. And we've learned a lot through our surveys around some of the concerns that are coming up through around governing documents, especially and how to how to do certain things during during the pandemic. 
I think someone's maybe not on mute. I can hear somebody in the background there. Um, so we've had a lot of unexpected issues coming up for, for, for lots of people in relation to governance, everything from I don't think we're allowed to have our AGM um, virtually um, to, to how do we actually meet, how do we keep core it and so on. So lots of things have been coming, coming through and what we want to do is answer some of those common questions as well as some of the interesting quirks and queries that have been coming up along the way. Um, but we want to make sure that we can share all of those lessons. So once we um, finish today, we'll also make sure that we share the presentation so you don't have to sit and scribble lots of notes. Um, that we will share it, the sort of transcripts and anything else that we can. And we'll send you out lots of links too, because there are lots of people who have some of the specific answers to the queries and concerns you have. So I really hope everybody gets a lot out of today. Um, it'll only be as good as your participation too. So as I say, I'm glad to have some advanced questions and some extra ones coming through. And um, the last thing I want to just remind you of is at the end, we will ask you about some evaluation. Always boring to, 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 to think about, but really vital for us because we really like and appreciate getting feedback and we do take it quite seriously. And we have been honing events every time we hear about them because everybody um, has, has has useful things to share so please do do that briefly at the end of the session so without further ado i'm going to hand over to martin hi everyone yeah as uh, as maureen said um, my name's martin tyson and i'm oscar's head of regulation and improvement um and what i'm going to be talking to you about today is uh, governing documents how to update them uh, and some of the, the, the key things that, uh, the key questions that we've been having from charity trustees and from charities, uh, particularly through the, uh, the, the lockdown and, and the issues that the, the people have encountered. So if we can move on to the second slide, please. Yeah, that's just a, a, an outline of uh, what um, I'm going to be talking about. So starting off with the, the big question, you know, what is a governing document? Uh, and I think maybe sort of I'll, I'll, I'll drill down a, a little bit, bit more into that and, and also why do we have a, a governing document, what's the point of it? And then move on, I think, to uh, what goes to make up a governing document, what are the main clauses, uh, what are the, 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 the main, uh, what kind of stuff is, is in a, a governing document, why is it important, and you know, thinking about also how it fits together. Um, then move on to uh, one of the, the, the key sort of points that can be quite complex with governing documents, and that is how they are affected by what kind of legal form your charity has. Um, one of the unfortunate things that uh, happens when, when people ask us questions about their governing documents and about what they do with them, uh, one of the unfortunate things there is quite often the answer is, ah, it depends. And one of the big things that it depends on is what kind of legal form your charity has. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Then talk a little bit about good governance, uh, particularly in, in relation to your governing document, you know, what it's like to, be, to, to, to uh, do a good job of governance around your governing document, uh, to think about updating it and, and making sure it's, it's fit for purpose, uh, reviewing it regularly. And then come on to the uh, what, what's probably the, the, the big topic uh, over the, the, the past 18 months, which is uh, what governing documents uh, have to say about uh, virtual meetings, uh, how people can update their governing documents uh, to make sure that they can accommodate the way that they're working now. Uh, then I'll talk about the, the, the various sort of uh, bureaucracy that you need to do around that and where you can find some help for, for doing that. So if we can just move on to the next slide, please, Ian. Uh, and that is really just talking a little bit about what a governing document is. Um, so got a definition there. Charity's governing documents, the written statement that sets out its purpose, its structure, and describes how it will operate. Um, now, your governing document might have a, a different name and you know, almost certainly won't be called a governing document. It might be called a constitution, might be called a, a memorandum and articles, might be called a trust deed, or there's a bunch of other exotic things that can be called. But that's the basic idea of it. Uh, it's the set of rules that uh, the charity trustees and the other people involved in the, the charity need to follow. Um, 
and it'll vary, as I say, according to the, the, the legal structure that your charity has, according to whether your charity is uh, unincorporated or incorporated. But more than that, I think it's worth thinking about what the governing document is for. Um, sometimes when we're you know, speaking to charities, especially when it's, uh, you know, we're speaking to them in, in, in the context of, of, of trouble going on in a charity, you know, people will feel uh, the governing document gets in the way. Uh, you know, it, it's not working for us. Uh, people are using it against us. And I think it's worth unpacking a, a few of those things. The point of the governing document is to support the, the charity trustees uh, in, help, in, in running the charity. Uh, it's there to support you, particularly when you have uh, difficult decisions to make, uh, when you have big decisions to make around uh, the charity, where you have controversial decisions to make, where there's differences of opinion. It tells you how to uh, navigate your way through and, and have those discussions and, and how to make decisions and what the uh, what the limits are of those decisions. It should be there to support you. If you feel it's not, well, that might be a good reason for looking at it again. Another thing uh, to think about, you know, what's a, a charity's governing document for? In terms of the law, it's actually a public document. Uh, your, your constitution, your governing document, is one of the documents which, if you're asked for it by a member of the public, you're usually expected to supply it to them so that the people who are dealing with you know what your rules are, know what the constraints are and, and, and what the limits are on your powers as a person managing a charity. So it, it's worth thinking about those things uh, in terms of, of what a governing document's for. That's why it's important. That's why it's important for you to know what's in it. So if I can move on in. Okay. So what's usually in uh, a governing document? There's some absolutely key things that, that have to be there, uh, and there'll be some other things where what and, and, and how much is there will, will be variable according to the, the, the different uh, complexities of constitution and the different legal forms. But there's some key things that actually have to be there. You know, a, a constitution will need to say in some shape or form what the charity is there to do. It needs to state its charitable purposes. Um, if nothing else, you know, it, when we're looking at an application to be registered as a charity, that's what we'll want to see. Um, so that's a, a, an absolute key clause that's usually in near the start of a constitution. Usually after that, the uh, constitution, the, the governing document will say what, what powers the charities has, what powers the charity trustees have to further those charitable purposes. What kind of things can it do? What are the limits on what it can do? There'll be rules about the charity's finances and property, uh, who controls it, and what they can be used for. And you know that, that, that can be more or less complex. Uh, sometimes they will say that, uh, for instance, that uh, a charity can only spend uh, its income. It can't touch its capital. There might be rules like that. Uh, generally, there'll be some overarching clause that will say that the, the, the charity's assets and, and its property can only be used for the charity's purposes and to further those. There will almost always be something about uh, who the charity trustees are, uh, how many of them there should be, uh, and how they get appointed, how they get removed, um, what are the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the ways that they go about uh, their duties, uh, what they have to do in terms of conflict of interest, for instance. Uh, if uh, the charity has a membership, if it's, a, if, if it's that kind of organization, if it has that kind of structure, there'll be provisions that say uh, how you get to be a member, who the members can be, what the qualifications are, uh, or, or the limits to being a member, and what the, 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 uh, you know, the, 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 the types of, of uh, restriction are on membership. If we move on to the next one, please, Ian. Get the uh, the next slide, please. Oh no, I think sorry, we've gone back. That's the one. Okay. So uh, the other main clauses, there will be rules about charity trustees and members meetings, uh, including AGMs, and obviously this is something we'll talk about in a bit more detail later. 
Uh, it'll talk about how they're arranged, what notice there has to be of them, uh, how they'll be conducted, uh, how you make decisions, you know, if you have to vote on a decision, how that goes, how decisions should be recorded, uh, what you have to do to make different kinds of decision. Uh, one of those uh, might well be how to change the governing document, and another one where there'll generally be some um, specific provision uh, will be a clause around how to close the charity down. Uh, you know, those kind of clauses will usually be in most modern constitutions. Uh, and think about where we are now with uh, the majority of new charities that are coming off the register, uh, coming on as SCIOs. It's really worth noting that uh, the constitutions for SCIOs, for Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organisations, have uh, clauses that are required by law. There are clauses that have to be there in your constitution, in your, your governing document. Uh, and those clauses have to be there uh, for us to, to put it on the register and they shouldn't be removed. Uh, there are lots of uh, SCIO model constitutions out there, particularly the SCVO have them, uh, that have all of the, uh, the main clauses in there. Um, and all the required clauses. There's also a, a, a SCIO checklist uh, that's available uh, to make sure that the, the right clauses are, are there. Um, and one of the issues that we do see um, when we uh, are looking at, at whether to register charities is that people have used a model constitution and they've decided to do a bit of pick and mix and they have taken some of the required clauses out and we have to negotiate with, that, with the, the, the applicants there to, to try and get them back in. And the other thing that we do see is, is that when a skier is going along, uh, the charity trustees decide to have a, a look at the, uh, the constitution and again, take some of the required clauses out and uh, you know, the, 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 the constitution uh, becomes invalid and they have to sort of change those back. So particularly with a with, 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 with a SCIO, uh, you need to look at how the, the constitution as a whole uh, meets the requirements of that particular legal form and, and meet the requirements of the law. I'm just sort of thinking more generally about the, the, the kind of pr problems that we, we see with the way that people put constitutions together and uh, the way that the, the, the clauses are put together. One of the things you see, again, with people using a lot of the uh, model constitutions um, is that uh, they will just sort of send them in. The, the, the people who, the, the, the organizations that have uh, written model constitutions will leave gaps, for, for instance, for uh, the, the, the number of trustees and the, the applicants will forget to put in the, the, the number. So you just get a sort of blank in there. So it's worth having a look at that. It's also worth looking at the, um, how the, the, the constitution as a whole hangs together. All of those separate clauses need to, um, to work together. They need to make sense as a whole. And you know, particularly with things like the, the, the number of charity trustees and, and, and quorum and, and, and all those numbers. We have seen cases where the arithmetic simply doesn't add up. People haven't looked at how the, 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 the you know, and sat down and thought about how the constitution as a whole works. Uh, so it's 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 really worth having a, a think about that. Okay, if we just move on to the next one, please. Okay, and this comes up with that uh, that matter I was I was talking about around legal form. So. Uh, this is the, 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 the legal structure that your, your, your charity has. And uh, we have four main types of legal form for charities on the register. That's the SCIO, the Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organization. We have the company, uh, unincorporated associations and charitable trusts. And those fall into uh, two main groups, the incorporated structures, which are SCIOs and companies and the unincorporated ones, which is uh, unincorporated associations and, and charitable trusts. And um, the difference, the, 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 the difference really there is that uh, an incorporated organization has its own legal identity. It's, uh, it, it has what the lawyers call legal personality. 
And what that means is that uh, it, as an organization, as an entity, can own property, it can enter into contracts, and it can employ people in its own name. The other key thing about being incorporated is that uh, the liability of the organization uh, to third parties, it, it, it's, it's limited to the, 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 the total amount of, of the member's guarantees. So for uh, a, a, a company limited by guarantee, uh, generally the, the, the members will pay uh, some nominal amount, uh, like a pound, and that is the limit of their liability. Uh, and that gives a, a, a protection to the, 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 the people who uh, run the organization, its members in, in, in most cases. Um, but what it does mean is that uh, your know, charity trustees uh, need to take their responsibilities really seriously. Uh, if you're a company, you are bound by company law. You have uh, reporting duties to, 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 to company's house. Uh, similarly with, uh, with the SCIO, uh, both the charity trustees and the members have duties uh, in return for that uh, limited liability. Uh, the Corporate Association um, is, you know, that's a, 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 a sort of, a, if, you, if you like, a, 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 an agreement between a collection of individuals and the association itself doesn't have legal identity. Um, if it wants to own property, it has to rely on the individuals to, to, to own that on, on its behalf. And that increases the, the, the risk of liability for uh, the people involved in running the, the organisation. Um, I mean, it's worth saying, you know, even with a company or a SCIO, uh, there can be some liability for the people uh, running it if they act uh, or they're pr proven to act uh, negligently or, or recklessly or, or uh, with their, their powers. So it's, it's, it's not a, a sort of get out of jail under all circumstances. Um, but uh, I suppose what, what, what I say in, in general is that the unincorporated uh, legal forms in many ways are very simple uh, and an incorporated association is a very simple thing to, to, to set up and it stays simple until you start to do something like employ people or try to, 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 to buy property. At that point it becomes kind of complicated and that's when people start to look at moving into becoming a skill or becoming a company. Okay yeah we can move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so really just talking a little bit about uh, good governance around governing documents. Um, it seems like a, a very simple thing uh, to say that every charity trustee should have an up-to-date copy of the governing document, that they should have read it, they should know what's in there, and they should understand what it means. That sounds kind of simple and kind of obvious um, until uh, you, you, you think about what charities can be like in action. Um, if you think about charities that have a, a rapid turnover of trustees, I'm thinking about things like uh, playgroups or you know things like scouts and guides where there'll be a, a you know, really rapid turnover of trustees, that, that can be quite a, a difficult thing to ensure. And that's one thing where really good induction for charity trustees is is really important make to make sure when you're taking on charity trustees into the charity that they get a, a copy of the governing document and that there's a little bit of discussion around that so that they know what's in there and it goes back to that point that i was making at the beginning about the uh, the governing document being something that's there to support you as a charity trustee and and, and help you with your decision making and, and, and with what you need to do and that comes up that second point there uh, when you're planning what the charity will do when you're running the charity when you're taking all, all those decisions when you're thinking about uh, what you're going to do next year what you're going to do the year after when you're thinking about what grants you're going to apply for and what projects you're going to do uh, you need to make sure that the plans fit with the governing document uh, and, and what it says you can do um, does it fit with the charitable purposes will it further the charitable purposes have you got the power to do the thing that you want to do and I think the other point, and this is the, 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 the biggie, is uh, you need to make sure that you maintain and review the governing document regularly. You need to make sure it's still fit for purpose. If you feel it's getting in the way, if you feel it is 
too constricting if you feel it's not supporting you in what you want to do if you are getting um if you, you're, you're finding it difficult to make decisions if you're getting regular uh, disputes then you need to go back and have a think and look at that governing document and see if it's doing the stuff it's supposed to do okay if we can move on please um so if you are looking at a governing document if, you, if you're undertaking that review what are the kind of things you should think about well i think one of those big thing, things is is what we, we spoke about before have you still got the right legal structure for the stuff that you're doing do you need to think about incorporation so are you taking on staff are you looking to own a building are you entering into contracts um if so, and if you're a, a, an unincorporated association, then you might well find it really difficult to do that. Or the, the arrangements that you have to put in place to, to let you do that start becoming more complicated than going back and looking at uh, your, your legal form. Um, do your charitable purposes still fit? Uh, and that comes back to that, that, that question of uh, planning and looking at what the charity is going to do are they still up to date? Uh, if uh, your charitable purposes limit you to helping particular people or operating in particular geographical areas, is that still right? Um, do you have charitable purposes that were drafted 30 years ago when the law was different, when society was different? Do they still work? And that's that, that, that's a key one uh, because uh, one of the, the, the big issues that we see, the big issues that we get concerns about from the public and, and from members of charities is that sense of, of sort of mission drift of charities moving away from their purposes um i'm in more in more generally um do you, does the the uh governing document still make sense uh do the, the the provisions around how you make decisions do they still work are they helpful uh are you able, you know, if there are, uh, if it has things to say about how you hold general meetings or, or uh, how you put a resolution to a meeting, actually, do they work? Do you have, does it ask you to have too many people there? Does it, uh, is it clear? Uh, are you getting disputes about whether a decision has been made or not? So it's, it's worth thinking about those things. Uh, and obviously, one of the, the, the questions that's particularly come up there is, uh, you know, virtual meetings. Uh, what happens when you can't get together in, in the old way that we we, we used to do? Uh, can you you know meet online? Can you meet by phone? Um, I think just sort of pulling back the focus as well uh, is your constitution uh, too complicated? Does it you know is there too much of it? Does it try and deal with every eventuality? Could it do with being simplified? Do, you know, are there bits that you simply don't understand? And I think the, the other uh, way to look at it is, uh, will this do into the future? Is it going to be adaptable or is it, uh, you know, d does it look old fashioned? Uh, is it easily comprehensible? And uh, just, you know, look at some of those questions as well. Okay, if we can move on to the next one, please. Okay, and um, this is, again, sort of getting to the, the nub of it and, and a lot of the, the, the questions that we've had from charities over the past, uh, well, 18 months now, I suppose, that we've, uh, we've been dealing with the pandemic and, and with lockdown. Uh, and this is virtual meetings. And, and these are uh, some of the, the, the questions that we, we have had uh, very commonly from charity trustees, from charities. Um, so it's locked down or it's very difficult to get charity trustees together in person um, and charity trustees are, are wanting to, to have an AGM or have a meeting uh, online uh, virtually and one question we get is uh, do we need to change our governing document so that's one of those questions where it depends uh, and it depends very much on your legal form um, if you're a SKU or if you're a company, then you would be pretty unwise to uh, go on for a long time or permanently uh, with virtual meetings without updating your governing document if they don't, if it doesn't currently talk about it. Now, 
we have taken a, a very sort of understanding attitude to that and uh, what was said where, where people are finding it difficult to make updates to their governing document to do that, uh, that will uh, understand that that's not always possible. Uh, if you are just having to, to sort of work around that for the time being, then what we'd say is to record the reasons for holding a, a, a virtual meeting in the minutes of the meeting until you're able to make the changes to your governing document at a later date. Um, if you're in an unincorporated association, it's maybe a bit less necessary to, to, to change your governing document to make sure that you can uh, hold virtual meetings unless your constitution somehow explicitly forbids it, which very rarely happens. But it's good governance practice. It, it's something to, to, to look and take care of uh, at your next AGM. Um, with trusts, uh, if, if you've got a modern trust deed, you're likely to have a, a, a clause that will allow you to make uh, changes. Uh, in older trust deeds, uh, again, the uh, general stat the statute law might give you powers to do that. But uh, it's sensible to, to maybe take uh, some professional advice on that. So if you decide you do need to change your governing document to let you have uh, virtual meetings, what do you need to include? That's you know, a, a matter for you because it, 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 you know, it, it depends on how it fits together with the rest of the document. It depends what you want to do. What we would say is there are some really good uh, model uh, documents uh, and, and model clauses. Uh, SCVO in particular have some uh, with, with clause by clause explanations on their website. Um, some charities have taken the whole thing on board, the whole model. Some people have just added in the appropriate clauses. Uh, I think that you know the, the the thing we would say there is it's not necessary to pay for advice in this in that area. The the, the models are available and, and helps available from play, places like the the, the TSIs uh, and plenty of charities have made the changes quite satisfactorily quite quickly without taking professional advice. Uh, do you need permission to change? Um, no. If all you're changing is the uh, the clauses around uh, holding meetings, uh, then that's something that you uh, need to notify us to tell us about after you've made the change. Um, and you need to make that change in line with what's in your constitution. If you're a charitable company, you need to tell company's house. If you are changing something else as well, uh, if that something else is uh, the purpose of the charity or the name of the charity, then you need our consent and there's guidance on that on our website in terms of you know, how you how you change the governing document well you need to follow the clause that's it or the clauses that are in your governing document about making changes uh, and, and that's it's absolutely key that you do that um and whether you have the the the, the power to, to make amendments well i've already that that again will depend to an extent on the um, your, your legal form, and we've spoken a little bit about that. Um, how quickly do you need to do it? Again, that depends on the legal form and you know the the the, the circumstances there. Um, you know, it's it's about uh, how quickly it's possible to get members together to to vote. Uh, on ratifying the changes, what your governing document says. Uh, I think we uh, are very flexible about timescales for changes, but what we would want to see is if, if charities need to update their, 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 their coming documents, that they do that, uh, you know, that update their governing documents, that they do that uh, in the, the coming year. If not before their AGM, then at their AGM, if they're needing to make those, those changes rather than operating with uh, you know on, on a sort of temporary basis okay if we uh, move on to the next slide and this is just you know uh, hopefully sort of clarifying that uh, point about uh, when you need our permission uh, for changes and when you need to notify us so if you are changing your charitable purpose or your uh, charity name 
then uh, you need our consent. If you're making any other changes, including changes to, to how you have meetings uh, or any other administrative clauses in the charity, then you don't need our consent. You just need to notify us. Uh, and again, just to underline, uh, you need to follow the rules in your governing document when you're making changes. Okay, and the next slide, please. And that is about uh, how you notify us. So uh, once you've uh, made the changes in line with your, your governing document, uh, you should notify us uh, of the changes. There's a form on our website to, to help you do that. And you send us a, a, a copy of the new version of the constitution. Again, I mentioned it before, but if you're a, your charity is a, a charitable company, then you need to change and uh, file those changes with Companies House as well as with us. Uh, a question that, that, that often comes up, um, the changes are, are, are for charity trustees and for, for charities to make and, and for them to make sure that they have done them in line with what their governing document says. We, uh, we don't have a decision to make there about that. Uh, the, the, the requirement is that you tell us about them. Uh, so we do not check the changes that have been made. Uh, and you know, we, we, the, that's uh, not something that we do. Uh, we, we, we don't second guess what, uh, what charity trustees have, have done there. So that really is uh, something for you to make sure that you've done in line with your constitution and that the, the, the changes have been properly made. Uh, we will operate on the, 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 the assumption that you have done that and, and we will you know, take the uh, new version of the constitution in and, and keep that on file. And lastly, uh, just looking at where to find help. So we've got a lot on our website about making changes to your charity. We've got a lot about the process of moving from being an unincorporated charity to an incorporated one, which is not necessarily a simple process. Uh, we've got a lot of guidance there about meeting the charity test. That's, you know, we, 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 those are all uh, things that we, we have information about. Mentioned all the way through, about the model documents that uh, SCVO have. Those are very widely used. They're, they're, uh, you know, we, we see those a lot and, and they're very simple. They're very well laid out. Uh, you know, for the, the, they have um, model documents for all of the, the, the different uh, legal forms that I've talked about, SCIO, Unincorporated Association, Charitable Company and Charitable Trust. Uh, and they have a lot of, of support and information around them. So that's one place to start. Uh, a lot of the other umbrella organizations will have you know, specialized models for uh, you know, particular types of charity. And again, those are, are, are really helpful if, if, if you fall into one of those categories. In terms of support, uh, you know, talking to people around the, the, the decision making, uh, then there are also the third sector interface and you know, there's people from uh, a number of the TSIs on, on the call today uh, and they um, are you know, very familiar with uh, a lot of the issues around making changes to governing documents and a lot of the, the issues that people can run into with governing documents. So I think that's uh, all I've got to say. Uh, I think that, that you've been noticing various sort of you know, queries sort of flashing up on the chat there, and, and we had various uh, questions uh, came in to us before the meeting. So uh, I'll maybe hand over Judith, hand over to Jude to uh, take us forward with with the Q and A. Great, thank you, Martin. Um, we've got a number of questions that we've grouped them. Paul has gone through and, and looked at them and, and grouped them a bit. So we're going to start off with them. Uh, carry on putting stuff in the chat, please do. And I want to let, let you know that Steve Kent and Martin will be doing the heavy lifting of answering the questions. So that's very kind of them. Um, we will hopefully have some time at the end to respond to verbal, but as you can see, we're, we're, we're quickly running out of time. So we'll see how we go. Um, so let me just ask the first question to Steve, if you're ready, Steve. Um, and there's a question, a very interesting um, question around, sometimes you're making a number of changes. So is there any advantage sometimes to starting with a brand new document rather than attempting to just update singular clauses? Would there be any advantages to that? Um, well, it certainly isn't 
um, it certainly isn't necessary to um, start with a, a fresh document every time you're making amendments. It's perfectly acceptable to um, sort of amend the, the existing document. However, I mean, there might be advantages um, if the proposed changes are multiple or substantial, um, or if the present document is very old, especially if it's been amended and on a number of occasions previously, um, or if it's um, you know if the, the document is so old that it doesn't conform to um, sort of some of the newer models that are are available. There's always a risk when you start making piecemeal amendments to a, a, a document, as, as Martin indicated in the presentation, that you start to introduce inconsistencies, that you have clauses that, that contradict each other or, or, or are incompatible, or that you run into sort of a numbering errors, for example, so that the clauses don't cross-reference with each other. Um, so, um, it, you know, you can avoid all of that by starting from a, a new template documents, but but that's a that's a purely sort of optional decision on the on the part of the the charity. Just bear in mind if you do start with a new document that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, I suppose, and you know inadvertently throw out important clauses which you 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 wish you had retained, and in particular, bear in mind that. Um, some of the changes that Martin indicated, particularly changes to purposes that would require Oscar's consent beforehand. Thank you, Steve. That's very helpful. Um, passing back to Martin now, um, how often should uh, charity trustees be thinking about updating their governing documents? Is there a suggested review period? Yeah. OK, so th this is one of those ones where we say, ah, it depends, and everyone goes, oh, thanks very much. Um, I think regularly, and by regularly, I, I would say, you know, have a think about it every couple of years. Um, you know, it's tempting to say, well, you should you know, have a look at it every year, but that's probably too, you know, too, too, too often for, for, for most charities. I think the, the, the thing I would say is keep an eye on the environment and the context that you, you're operating in. So if you're somewhere where, you know, let's say the laws changed around the stuff that you do, uh, does that mean you should go back to your, your governing document? Um, you know, I mean, a, a few years ago, there were big changes to uh, to company law. And, you know, lots of people had a, a, a look at their memoranda and articles then. Uh, is there anything else that's changed in what you do that, that, that should lead you to review it? I think otherwise, if, there, if there's none of those sort of environmental things happen, then I, I, I would say regularly, and you shouldn't go more than a, a few years without uh, having a look at, at your constitution. It goes back to thinking that, that you need to know what's in there anyway. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise to you. Uh, and, and, you know, I hate to say it, but it is a surprise to, 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 to a whole bunch of people uh, we do get a, 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 a bunch of queries every year from charities saying, can you please send us a copy of our constitution because we don't have one. Um, those charities definitely haven't reviewed their constitution regularly. <laughs> I think we don't Thank, you, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. That's great. Um, moving on, I think this is a very important question and it's something that we do get asked. Do you need a lawyer to submit an amendment to your governing document to your constitution that has been agreed by your board? Steve, I can give that one to you. Uh, no, no, you don't. Uh, you don't need a lawyer to notify um, Oscar of changes to your constitution. You can do it um, simply by writing or emailing to Oscar with a copy of the, uh, the amended document and ideally with the wording of the, the resolution or, or the minutes of the meeting where the, um, the amendment was agreed. There's actually a simple form on our website for, for notifying us of changes, so you can, uh, you can use that. Um, although a lawyer isn't required, um, you should, as Martin was uh, said during the presentation, bear in mind that the constitution is a, is a legal document and therefore the trustees may wish to take professional advice before making changes, particularly if those changes are, are substantial. But one of the, um, the third sector interface, you know, the TSIs ought to be able to assist with that as well. There was um, just one thing I picked up in the question there. The question says um, changes that were agreed by the board. It's worth checking the constitution to make sure that the board actually has the power to make the amendments, because more often than not, if it's a membership organization, the power to amend the constitution rests with the members through a resolution in a general meeting, not with the board. 
Thanks, Steve. Yeah, that's a very, a very important clarification. Thank you for that. Um, we're moving on now to talk about something that's come up a lot. So it's about virtual meetings and, and it's about the wording that people should be using in their governing documents around that, Martin. Yeah. Um, again, the, the, you know, that partly depends on, on what you're wanting to do and, and, and you know, how you want your uh, charity to work. But I think most people, uh, you know, uh, and I would advise them to, to do this, you know, start off with uh, what, what's in some of the model documents. That, you know, there's a lot of thinking already been done around this, so why reinvent the wheel? Uh, and uh, SCDO, as, as I've said, have uh, model documents uh, for the four main types of governing document. And those models now all have virtual meeting clauses as part of the standard document. Uh, those are, 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 are documents that lots of charities are using that have been sort of trouble free. So it's it's worth maybe just you know at least looking at them to start with. Thanks, Martin. Yes, it's always good if you don't have to do too much work to get that stuff done. Um, in terms of a, uh, this is a question that comes up a lot, and I guess the answer will probably be it depends, Steve. But is there a minimum amount of trustees that are required for a charity? Um, well, you're right. It does depend. <laughs> <due to this. laughs> um, the the only legal form in Scotland that has um, a, a specified minimum number of trustees is the SCIO. The, uh, the the legislation says that a, a SCIO must have a minimum of three charity trustees. There's no legal minimum for any other legal form of charity, uh, but there may be a minimum specified in the constitution itself. And if the number of trustees falls below the minimum, the constitution will usually make um, some provision for, you know, that the trustees can only take action either to make appointments to fill vacancies or to call a general meeting of the members in order to allow the members to appoint additional trustees. And it's worth bearing in mind that if you continue to operate below the minimum number of trustees for any length of time, you are committing um, a breach of the constitution, which, um, which may have implications for the validity of decisions that are taken, or at the very least, it creates a risk that those decisions are, are open to challenge. And it may also potentially expose the remaining trustees to risks of personal liability if they're making um, unauthorized decisions. In terms of um, an appropriate minimum number of trustees, well, that will vary depending upon the, the size of the chain and makeup of the charity and, and the nature of its business. But um, I think we would generally recommend that best practice is that there should be, in all circumstances, a minimum of three trustees. Thank you, Steve. Um, moving on now, uh, says she who's lost her, the actual moving on bit. Um, excuse me, I've actually lost my page. Oh yes, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so basically, um, this is something that obviously has been very common this year, that having remote meetings is the only way to actually run your charity. So what's Oscar's latest guidance on charities holding remote meetings where this is not explicitly allowed in the governing documents, which Martin, you kind of touched on in the presentation, yeah. but if you could maybe reinforce, you know, what we're saying at the moment about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we are taking a you know the the, the most understanding view uh, possible here, um, you know where people are uh, holding virtual meetings and they don't have either an explicit or, or a, a, an implicit power to do that. Um, where they're saying why they're doing that and where they're they're saying they're going to take action when they can to sort that out, uh, we are. You know, got to be very sort of flexible uh, around that. Uh, you know, generally it, it's it's you know it's better to try and take the business of the of, of the charity forward uh, if you can, um, and we will take a very understanding view of that. But uh, you do need if, if you're doing something that uh, you don't have the power to do, you need to fix that. Uh, and particularly if you're a skill or you're a company and you're uh, wanting to continue having virtual meetings and you haven't got the power to do that in your governing document at the moment, then you need to take action to, 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 to do that um, as soon as you can. Um, with uh, unincorporated associations and, uh, and trusts, it's a little bit more flexible, but again, 
you know, in in the you know in the spirit of having a, a, a governing document that, that that's supportive and, and simple and, and and explicit and easy to use, uh, yeah, we'll get it fixed. You know, at the next you know good opportunity at, at the next you know AGM or, or 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 whatever it is, and and make it clear to everyone to 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 you as charity trustees to your members and, and to the people that you're dealing with that uh, you do have the power to do this. Great, thanks Martin. And I think that message of us being quite pragmatic about that stuff is something that we've tried to do throughout the year, I really understand the situation that people are in. So if you've been doing things, you're like, oh, we haven't been doing it quite right. Don't worry, just get it sorted out when you can. And we'll be very supportive of that because what we want is for people to move in the right direction. Um, one final question from the, the questions that were submitted, but it's really a question about what if you're struggling um, to get, if, if, if you, you may have proxy, proxy and postal voting, but you don't have a, enough people to actually be at a meeting, e even with that, to actually make the changes you need to make, what can you do in that situation? How can you overcome that situation where you need um, a certain number of people to make a change to your governing document, even if the quorum for a normal meeting is, is less? Steve, have you got uh, anything to say on that, some reflections on that? Um, well, I mean, certainly I think we, we recognise that um, for charities that have large memberships or um, so you're geographically spread memberships um, or members of people who may have sort of um, sort of mobility challenges, for example, then um, attaining large numbers at general meetings um, can can be uh, quite a challenge. And this is where the, the value of provisions in the constitution to allow for things like virtual meetings or um, attendance by, you know, by a proxy or postal voting um, or use of written resolutions can uh, becomes especially important, I think. Um, I mean, in terms of the procedure for making amendments, I mean, that will depend, as, as Martin said right in early on in his presentation, on the the legal form of the charity, uh, bearing in mind that, um, you know, the, the, sometimes the constitution will be silent on a matter, but that doesn't mean, I mean, what, what I think sometimes what we find is that it, where a constitution is silent on a question, charity trustees will um, sometimes assume one of two things. They either assume that they can't do something because it's not in the constitution, or probably worse still, they assume they can do it however they like. And what, you know, what that often uh, fails to appreciate is that there is there is law underpinning underpinning these legal forms. So, for example, in the case of a, a company, um, co company law specifies that a company can amend its article. The members of a company can amend its articles by means of a special resolution. And that's a resolution that requires a 75% of the votes cast at a meeting, or if it's done by means of a written resolution, 75% uh, of the total voting rights. Now, very often the Articles of Association itself will say nothing about that because it's enshrined within company law. Uh, simil similarly, with skios, there's a you know there's a a, a two-thirds majority provision required to amend a skio constitution which is, um, you know, in, in good SCIO constitutions is made express in the document, but it doesn't need to be there. Um, likewise, with the appointing of proxies, I mean, members of a company have a statutory right in company law to appoint proxies, even if the constitution itself, the articles say nothing about those things. So it, um, you know, it does mean that sometimes you have to look beyond the constitution itself for other provisions which are in law. And um, I think you know if you can't if you can't actually meet physically, and you need to introduce provisions to en um, enable you to meet virtually in future, then one way of doing that is to pass a written resolution um, in advance, um, uh, which will then enable you to meet virtually going forward in future. Thank you, Steve. That's that's very helpful. Now we've come. We, we are running out of time. But I'm, I'm planning on having at least another five minutes here to see if anybody has um, any questions before I uh, go back to to Steve um, and Martin. Does anybody have any questions they're burning to ask, or have they had them all answered in the chat, which I see has been very very active, which is great. No, I'm having a flick through. 
put your yellow hand up or raise your hands. No. Great. Guys in the chat, you've obviously done a very, very, very good job. Um, I just just before we go, Martin or Steve, is there anything you think we, you know, we should, you know, sum up, reinforce before we finish the session, Martin? Um, I think just that that that, that point that uh, you know, you, you, your your constitution should. Uh, well, I was going to say your constitution should be your friend, but that's terrible. Um, <laughs> your, your, your your constitution it should be useful to you, uh, and if it isn't, if it's you know, if it is frustrating you. If it's particularly if, it, if it's frustrating people taking a, a full and proper part, your members or, or your trustees taking a full and proper part in the decision making, then you need to look at it and make sure it does help you. Great. Steve, anything to add? Just, just, a, just a think to reinforce that point, Judith, um, that um, you know, a, a constitution does provide a degree of permanence for an organisation. You know, it, it does provide for continuity from one generation of members and trustees to the next so that people don't just come in and change it on a whim. But at the same time, it should be a living, breathing document. You know, it doesn't, you know, it needs to grow organically as the organisation grows and changes. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I think we'll we'll finish it there. Understanding, I think Paula's already put into the chat that she she these questions will be captured and we will send something out to everybody. So hopefully there'll be that will help with it, any of the questions that you you asked and then you have them recorded there for, for posterity, which would be great. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today. I want to ask you all very nicely if you can fill in the evaluation because it does help us decide how we're going to run these kind of improvement events going forwards and um, I want to thank everybody who's helped with today's event so Paula thank you for organizing Martin and Steve thanks so much for doing all the heavy lifting uh, I'm going to forget everybody now so everybody else thank you very much for coming and for supporting the event today and we really really appreciate the fact that you're willing to come and and take take part in these events with us such a lot of good questions were submitted beforehand that really, really helps us, you know, shape the event. So thank you for that. Um, we can only be a good regulator if we're really communicating with you and understanding what it is that you need. So thank you for that very much. And I'm just going to see if Molly wants to say goodbye before we leave. I will do. I just actually wrote it very quickly into the, the, into oh, the chat. But, but no, absolutely. And um, just to say it was so lovely to be with so many of you today. And thank you so much for being with us. Um, it, 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 it brings it alive for us to, 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 to make connections into um, seeing so, so many people from the charity sector. So thank you for everything you do. And thank you for working with us. Thank you. Have a lovely afternoon. I hope the sun's out where you are. Get out in the garden, have a cup of tea. Bye. <laughs>